Could be. Now, there we go. Can you hear me a little bit better? There we go. <laughs> um, so I'm going to briefly just talk about um, the opioid epidemic, and I can't see my slides very well, so I'm just going to try to remember what they said. Um, in terms of uh, really from the data perspective, uh, how we got here, um, talk about some myths about the epidemic, because I think that that's, um, both sides of this very charged and heated issue have really uh, tried to use data to promote a, a certain agenda. And so what I want to do is just kind of strip away that and really kind of talk about um, really from looking at the epidemiological surveillance systems that we have available to us, the mountains of data and studies that we've done over the past 10 or 15 years that really kind of highlight and really provide a, an insight into the course of the epidemic. And then really teed up for um, the other two panelists to talk about points of intervention, how can we fix this, and especially given the context of the, um, the two major pieces of legislation that are on the table. So I think it's important when we talk about opioids that we first understand uh, what exactly uh, it is because we have, um, you know, from a medical term and a pharmacological term, there are uh, some differences. I mean, people tend to think of, you know, I've heard of um, prescription opiates, they say, oh, it's just uh, legalized uh, heroin. And actually, there's going there's to be some very important pharmacological differences in terms of what these medications are and what we mean. In terms of, you know, how opium is, is derived and synthesized, uh, you know, we have sort of man-made, naturally occurring opiate, opiates, um, things like codeine, and then we have um, kind of more powerful synthesized uh, opiates. And, um, you know, so, so really when you think about it, you know, the question is, you know, is heroin and like prescription ox oxycontin, are they the same thing? Are they metabolized the same thing? Not necessarily, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. And one of the big factors is route of administration, you know, how, um, whether somebody just takes a pill is fundamentally different in terms of metabolism than somebody that injects or smokes uh, or uses some other form. So that's important to think about and understand because um, what really started to drive this epidemic is when people stopped taking these medications orally and started to tamper with them, inject, smoke, you know, kind of used to, used to go to um, other ways of, of consuming these, um, these medications to get high. The other thing, I think from a policy perspective, it's important for us to understand is what we mean by the crisis. And so we've heard about um, non-medical use, misuse, abuse, all these sorts of terms, you know, what do they mean? And some of the government systems talk about this term non-medical use. And it basically means that any use that isn't uh, authorized by a doctor, it's not prescribed, uh, it's you either you know got a medication from your you know friend's medicine cabinet, or you can misuse your own medication or abuse it. You know you can take medication from your doctor and kind of hold it back for so they come home ready rainy day. And so it really sort of boils down to two motivations. You know self treatment motivation where you're really maybe don't want to go to a doctor. You've got a migraine. You've got something going on. You have some unused med you know medicines in your cabinet versus those folks that are really hardcore users, of users, and those are the folks that are really driving the opioid epidemic. So I think we've all kind of seen this graph where, you know, we know that um, around 2008, 2009, you know, opioids, the overdoses uh, overtook uh, car accidents um, as being sort of the leading cause of unintentional uh, injury in the United States, and that kind of really started to, you know, kind of pique the interest of, of policymakers. Um, you know, what's really driving overdoses, if we really look at the people that are overdosing, both fatal and non-fatal, I think it's important to realize is that nobody overdoses on just one pill. Uh, it's usually a combination of pills, they're injecting, they're using a lot of other substances, and they have, also have a lot of other comorbidities going on. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times we've sort of seen the story of somebody said, well, you know, Johnny, Johnny High School quarterback, uh, got hurt in the game, got a couple of vitamins from you know, the doctor, and all of a sudden you know, he's now you know, hooked on opioids and you know, kind of uh, uh, you know, selling on the, uh, the, the corner of this street. And there's a long process that sort of goes in between that, and I think that's something that uh, often gets overlooked in terms of when we talk about the epidemic. The big thing is, it's everywhere. Um, the, the slide right there just illustrates just sort of, sort of how far we've come in just about seven or eight years. About eight years ago, that chart was almost completely blank. And, and so, you know, you think about just what's happening over the last six or seven years, and what that shows is really the prevalence of uh, overdoses uh, here in the United States. And we see some concentrations. You know, Appalachia is certainly very, very heavily hit, uh, as are some of the mountain states as well, kind of some of your rural areas. And we've kind of heard this as being a rural epidemic, but it also is now piggybacking onto the heroin epidemic as well. Okay. Um, and then, so you know, and so what do we mean by we say you know just uh, what you know what is this crisis? And so 
you know, it's it's not just the fact that we have you know more medicine, you know, more pills in, in, in our medicine cabinet. We, I think there's this narrative that's been that's been put out there saying like, you know, oh, people, um, you know, uh, doctors are prescribing too medication, too many medications, and and people are kind of hoarding it, and and uh, you know that that the, the the pure root of getting to the um, getting to the root cause of this is certainly prescribing less medication. But that's not entirely true if we look at sort of the factors that are actually driving the epidemic. Um, people that are overdosing, like I said, they're injecting, they're snorting, they're engaging in sort of high-risk behaviors. And also we're seeing some downstream effects too. Like for instance, there was an HIV epidemic in Indiana, central Indiana, of about 200 AIDS cases among Opana users that were injecting and they were needle sharing. So there's this, this epidemic is really inextricably linked with a lot of uh, other epidemics. And so folks that say like, well, if we just curve opioid prescribing, it's called bending the curve. If we just bend the curve downward and reduce the supply, well, it's gonna have a trickle down effect. But not necessarily. I mean, you know, there's been some studies that have shown, and there was one in JAMA Internal Medicine just two weeks ago that said, you know, that there were like 60% of people in their lifetime that have saved their prescription medications. But most of them really just save one or two tablets. And so most of those medications aren't the medications that are funneling down to the street level, right? It's mostly, you know, we've got counterfeit medications that are coming up from Mexico, they're coming from, down from, from Canada, there's the synthetics, and so, you know, yes, curbing opioid prescribing is gonna help, but it's not gonna really solve it. There's other things and other ways that we can, we can intervene, like we use the term formulations of, of uh, medications, which are basically formulations that make it hard to uh, crush or snort or tamper with the medication. And I, I keep on coming back to this notion of, I think tampering is really the key thing that's been driving this opioid epidemic. And so, you know, back how we start, how, how the opioid epidemic was really started was how the pills were formulated. It wasn't the supply of opioids, but it was the first the prime mover in this was, back in 1995, Purdue Pharma reformulated OxyContin. And um, one of the nice things about it is an extended release formulation, which means it needed less pills. But by needing less, less pills, what that also means that in terms of comparing it to immediate release formulation was people thought, well, less pills mean equals less likely to be addicted. So then docs thought, okay, well, if I'm less likely to be addicted, well, then I can prescribe it you know, to maybe high-risk patients, I can prescribe it to kids. And so that's what really started this, this sort of epidemic of over-prescribing that we tend to see today was, the pharmaceutical industry working very closely with the medical industry to sort of craft this notion that opioids were safe. And it started this notion of chronic opioid therapy that you can put people, put somebody on opioids uh, long term. And then there was this notion of pain as the fifth vital sign, which was adopted by the hospital association. So patient ratings, how the doctors got paid actually drove a lot of this. So when you left the hospital, you get a note of like uh, a question, you know, how well was your pain treated? And it was on a scale of one to five, you know, and docs wanted you know, patients to be sort of treated as a five. And there are also altruistic purposes too. I mean, no doctor wants to see their patient in pain. pain. So thinking like, well, we have tools that can treat our patients, they can um, be treated safely, aha, no addiction. But that still didn't move the problem. What moved the problem was about 2000, some very ingenious people figured out that if I crushed that formulation and snorted it and tampered with it, I get the whole bolus at once. The one thing that was protecting that extended release dose that's keeping that person to a steady state of medication was when that, when that medication got crushed. Then all of a sudden, boom, that was the spark that really drove a lot of bad things starting to happen. So then all of a sudden, you know, we, we had this big sort of curvature up in terms of the non-medical uh, pain reliever abuse. Um, but, you know, really if you look at the data, after about 2004, the number of abusers remained relatively stable. Uh, so we had a big jump between 1995 and about 2002 in terms of the rate of abuse. Then it stayed stable. So then why did all these bad things start happening if, if the number of people that abuse stayed stable and now it's been starting to go down a little bit? Uh, but yet overdoses, all these other bad things, addiction, drug treatment are going up. Well again, it's because people are tampering with it. They're engaging in very high-risk behaviors that are moving them to addiction and to do very, uh, very difficult things uh, to, to, addict, uh, to, to get addiction. Um, and so here's uh, here's just a, a sample in terms of uh, you know uh, you know what what sort of the next step in addiction because now that we're starting to make it more difficult uh, to get uh, prescription opioids but again it's not in making it more difficult it's actually more difficult for, for an abuser to get the opioids that they want it's uh, in in 2010 Purdue reformulated OxyContin and so now it was like the drug that the abusers really loved now all of a sudden was more difficult to get. So they couldn't get the drug that they wanted. So it wasn't the fact that they couldn't get prescription opiates on the street, although it was drying up, 
but it was that they couldn't get that really high formulation, you know, that 80 milligram tablet that they just absolutely love. And so they said, well, if I can't get it through that, I'm not going to crush 15 hydrocodone pills, which are lower strength and that can get me high. I'm going to go to heroin. So again, the tampering was what moved people from, from, uh, uh, from uh, you know, in, into heroin. I don't think it was the supply or the lack of supply. Again, it was how the medications were, were formulated. So now, you know, we had kids that started out through, uh, through you know, engaging in prescription, uh, prescription pills. And a lot of questions that we get asked are, how long does it take to get addicted? And that's a magic number. It's, it's, it varies for everybody. But some studies have shown that it can take about two months before the body starts exhibiting sort of physical, physical tolerance, you know. And, and even in a normal subject, you know, somebody that's in a normal medical condition, you know, they will become physically addicted to pain meds. But, but then what sort of separates them is um, doctors that are, are aware of it can safely titrate that person back down, kind of taper the dose, kind of get them back off addicted so that when they leave the purview of the doctor, that's when they don't necessarily have to then say, okay, now I'm addicted, my doc left me hanging, what do I do now? And that's been a problem. Um, so, but again, people that are addicted to heroin or to prescription pain relievers, um, they, you know, not just use those medications, they use a lot of other drugs. So the total number of drugs used by a heroin addict or an opiate addict is about four. Uh, so they're using mostly benzodiazepines. You know, they, we kind of call them the garbage head approach because they can really are trying to use whatever they can get their hands on. And so some of the, um, the bills that are out right now, I think that are important, you know, trying to restrict the supply of opioids, I think are important. Safer prescribing guidelines by the CDC are also important. But I think they go a little short in terms of leaving this big gap about abuse deterrent formulations. And also increasing access to treatment is a big thing because for right now, like many states like Vermont, it can take up to six months to get treated. So we need to sort of frame our model in terms of thinking about it as treatment, not as treatment, but as prevention. So if I get somebody to treatment for an opioid problem, for a prescription opioid problem, I could actually potentially um, uh, prevent their, their heroin problem. So we need to think about these things as, as not being sort of separate, but you know, very important and, and strictly linked. And also you know, recognizing that, again, sort of the tampering phenomenon is really what's, what's driving a lot of these things. You know, people that are rejecting, when you inject or you're, you snort, you get that bolus of medication really, really quickly, and you think about it's how easy it is to get uh, uh, to get uh, uh, formulated, uh, to get to, to get into trouble. So, just a couple of quick graphs, if you can, we can send them to you. But I, I, you know, just to kind of talk about sort of how the form reformulation of oxycontin has kind of shifted the uh, the problem in abuse. And then I just want to leave with a couple of uh, you know, quick policy considerations. So I talked about some of the supply side issues that we're, that we're starting to see now that are, that are trying to reduce the, um, the supply of opioids uh, in the public. Um, and there's been some great federal initiatives. There's some great programs through, through SAMHSA and through CDC that are targeted toward you know, reducing the likelihood of opiates. Uh, opiate overdoses by supplying um, monies to prescription drug monitoring programs, which are very important tools. You know, prescription drug monitoring programs basically get the docs. It is an electronic system where a doc in any state can go on and look and see exactly, in some cases, real time what their patients are on. Um, but you know, that's a little problem because you know, medication sharing is still pretty rampant. You know, people get a hold of these things and they tend to, they tend to, uh, you know, cycle through the population uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, so, you know, what's next in terms of, uh, you know, where are we going to go really in the next five years? So, you know, um, insurance companies like Cigna uh, and uh, United Health are saying we want to set these opioid reductions to about 25% over the next, uh, you know, four to five years. Um, blind reductions are not going to work. Uh, like I said, I think the docs need to be more considerate of uh, who they're prescribed to. I think we need better patient tools to identify who's potentially at risk. Um, you know, some courses that, uh, you know, could be treated uh, very safely and effectively using a very, you know, low dose of an opioid um, with these types of policies can be very harmful to patient health because it's basically saying is, you know, no, you can't, um, you can't have the medications that you might need. And it's also going to be tough because, um, you know, we're, we're shifting as the baby boomers get down into the medical, you know, sort of twilight years. Um, the bulk of the population is now hitting the primary, you know, it's going from primary care to specialty care and to chronic, from acute, acute conditions to chronic conditions that often need uh, prescription opioids. So now we're, we're, we're having, so we're going to see an increase in the demand for medical care for, uh, for very important and debilitating disorders and diseases that are very painful and, and normally are prescribed opioids. 
Now we're going to be restricting the supply, so we're going to basically just create this gap that can be very, very dangerous. And um, you know, I, I don't know how some of your parents are, but if I told my dad just suck it up, I think I would get slapped. Um, so, um, so you know, kind of looping up is um, you know thinking about um, some of these uh, unintended consequences, realizing that every policy shift can have sort of another connection to it. Um, one of the other policy shifts that we're seeing is sort of um, people who are finding it difficult to find relief through opioids are moving to medical marijuana. So I think as we talk about this policy, we also need to talk about sort of complementary drugs that are sort of being developed. Um, there's new classes of medications that are um, basically sort of that treat the nerve endings. So without uh, without using an opioid that actually dulls the nerve, but it actually can can can, can actually cut the nerve. Uh, you know, sort of theoretically can be helpful. Um, and then. Um, uh, say. Uh, and then also thinking about you know, funding for programs, uh, uh, prevention program and treatment programs sort of across the, the life course. Um, access to uh, things like buprenorphine and methadone for opioid replace, uh, replacement therapy is, is very important. There's also new treatments for opioid disorders that are basically like depo formulations because you know, like if you have to come into a, a clinic every day to get a dose of methadone or suboxone, it can be you know, very disruptive to your life. And so actually, um, there's new medications that are coming out on the market that basically are kind of set it and forget it. You, know, you go in, you get your dosage of, of methadone or buprenorphine, it's injectable, it lasts in the body for 30 days, and you can kind of go about your life almost as a, as a normal person. And it's nice because it has some partially blocking effects, so it satisfies the craving, it can, it can help you know, prevent heroin and opioid relapse and, and sort of put us all in a, in a better place. So, um, so how we got here, I, I kind of distilled it and, and maybe oversimplified it, but um, I wanted to be a little challenging because I think it's sort of, uh, we, we've heard this narrative about, you know, the reason why we got here is, is more prescribing, so solving it's going to be less, less prescribing. And I wanted to just leave you with sort of what we think from the empirical data, what we're seeing is there's a little bit of nuance to the story that's not what, what, what's, how much is being prescribed, but what's being prescribed.